My name is Adam Bushakiewicz. And I'm Aaron Manning, and we're historians of Warwick Castle. This series looks at short stories of the owners of and objects in Warwick Castle. This podcast is dedicated to the life and achievements of George Greville, second Earl of Warwick. Born in 1746 and died in 1816, this Earl of Warwick did more so than any other to beautify Warwick Castle. He filled it with a matchless collection of old master paintings, furniture and arms and armour, in addition to redesigning its parkland. Moreover, George was also a painter and a poet, alongside his patronage of contemporary artists, of course. He is more widely known in Warwick's history for leading himself into a humiliating bankruptcy by 1800. So in preparation for today's uh, podcast, I decided to do a bit of bit of digging and I had a look at uh, George's uh, entry in the Oxford DMB. And I found this rather scathing summary by uh, the historian Matthew Kilburn to end it. So I'm just going to read it to you. George Earl of Warwick's career stood as an example of misguided aristocratic ambition. His failure to understand business and his desire to fashion a seat and setting worthy of the dignity of the Earls of Warwick brought himself and his family to ruin. So I wanted to ask, really, just to begin, whether you thought this was a fair summary. Yes, that's incredibly scathing, isn't it? But really, throughout this podcast, Aaron, I want to argue the fact that there are many different types of reasoning that we have in life. And one of the most important in our current age is instrumental reasoning, the idea that there is no value in anything unless it has some form of use. Very much today, utilitarianism is triumphant, that these are the only values that there are. But I think George Greville's career and his life and his achievements really does sum up the fact that he truly believed that beauty had a great importance in the world, and particularly for his castle, that although George did bankrupt himself, it was very much worth it, if that makes any sense whatsoever. So what uh, what can you tell me then uh, about George's upbringing? George's father was Francis, first Earl Brook and later first Earl of Warwick, who took great pains about George's education. Francis was orphaned from a young age himself, so I imagine that his son and heir's education was very important to him. His mother too was a very interesting lady. Her name was Elizabeth Hamilton. She was a descendant of the great Dukes of Hamilton's, of course, one of the most important aristocratic families of Scotland's history. So was George sent to school? Yes, after being born at Warwick Castle into this beautiful place, which his father was continuously improving, George was first sent off to Eton College. But it seems that he only spent a short while there because his father was worried about his son being corrupted by the loose living that was happening there. George was eventually sent off to Edinburgh University, where he lodged with the great historian William Robertson. I think this is really key because William Robertson was really one of the greatest historians of the Scottish Enlightenment. And I think the equivalent today would have been, you know, could you imagine the effect that living in the household of, of somebody like David Starkey would have on you. And I think it must have made an impression on this young boy who was going to inherit a great castle and a title too. And then shortly afterwards, he was sent off to Christ Church College in Oxford. And there are some portraits of George as a boy that survived. What do you think they can tell us about his character? The first portrait of George that was created shows him around the age of about 10. It was painted, in fact, by Joshua Reynolds, the first president of the Royal Academy, although it was painted before the Academy was established. And I think it shows him as a as a young bookish creature. It shows him holding his little book in his hand and looking very, I think, shy in a way. But then the next portrait that survives at Warwick Castle shows him as a very flamboyant character in his pink doublet with a wide white collar. It's very interesting that this portrait actually takes inspiration from Van Dyck's self-portrait a hundred years earlier. And it really, I think, makes him seem like quite a, a haughty and rather precocious young man. What do you think? Yeah, it's so fascinating. I, lo- I love the little glimpse over the shoulder that kind of captures you as you're looking at this this painting. It's, it's amazing to think he was obviously taking inspiration from Van Dyck. And was art part of his education growing up? 
Yes, one of the discoveries I've made is that this portrait of George in pink was actually made by George's tutor, a man called William Patoon, a Scot, who was in fact an amateur painter in his own right. So can you imagine that this young boy is being brought up and educated by a man who can paint as well as this? It's quite impressive, I think. Another discovery I've made in the Warwick Castle archive are George's watercolours that he made when he was a young man and when he was a boy. In fact, I found the watercolours that George made on his grand tour in the 1760s when he was probably in his late teens and early 20s. It shows, I think, that he was rather quite good and could really capture the atmosphere of a place, particularly landscape, which is a love that would follow him throughout his life. I've also found some very lovely little watercolours of George Greville's blots. What is a blot, you might ask? Well, this is a technique of watercolour painting that was taught by the very notorious artist Alexander Cousins. Cousins is very important because he was really one of the first artists to break away landscape painting from purely topographical means, but really trying to paint landscapes from the mind, a very important development in the history of watercolours. And you can imagine that this young boy, George Greville, an aristocrat, would have been taught, I think, by Cousins himself. What impression you imagine that might have made of him, I think is really quite amazing to think about. So when George became the Earl of Warwick after the death of his father in 1773, he he went on to become a great collector, particularly of, of art, paintings and, and portraiture. What can you tell me about that? Yes, it seems already from the off, and the account books show that before he even became the Earl of Warwick, he was starting to spend enormous sums of money at Christie's and other places like that. It seems that George really wanted to transform his castle into something of a, of a treasure box. The most important work of art he imported into the castle was the notorious Warwick vase, which unfortunately is no longer there. But this work of art came into his hands due to his uncle, the notorious Sir William Hamilton, envoy extraordinaire to the court of Naples. Sir William really was one of the 18th century's greatest antiquarians, and surviving letters show that George was actually writing to his uncle saying, well, if you come across any beautiful things off in Naples or in Italy when you're traveling, please buy them for me, <laughs> for my beautiful castle. And this is exactly what he did. The Warwick vase was actually bought by George after Sir William Hamilton failed in selling it to the, to the newly established British Museum. So you can imagine that so several very important pieces of sculpture and other artworks came into the collection of Warwick Castle through George's uncle. Wow, so he brought the Warwick vase in uh, 1776. Um, what kind of things was George buying at the same time? It's obvious that George was absolutely passionate about old master paintings, but in particular, he adored portraits. And what's interesting about this is one letter survives between George and his uncle, Sir William, and it describes that George wanted portraits of figures or heads in old dresses. And this is significant, I think, because it really shows, I believe, that George wanted pictures of historical figures to line the walls of his castle. Really, in other words, he wanted artworks that would enhance the historical associations of this beautiful home of his. To Georgians as well as us today, when we go to these places, we expect to see certain things, almost historical relics, with, which really put us in touch with the past. And I think this explains George's collecting habit. He loved portraits by the likes of Van Dyck, of course, Rubens and Rembrandt. Indeed, he had several masterpieces by these artists, including the famous portrait of the Earl of Arundel, which is now in Boston, in fact, by Rubens, showing the Earl dressed in armour. And I think he particularly loved portraits of men in armour because it, it really did evoke that chivalric history of the castle, which is what he wanted visitors and, and people exploring his castle to see. Yeah, goodness, you can really imagine the kind of influence the castle had over his purchasing of portraits. What role did the castle play in his patronage of living artists? Yes, not only was George buying ancient works of art, he was also a patron to living contemporary artists of the period. And some of these men actually went on to be very important artists in, in their own right. One of them was George Rumney, who eventually took over from Reynolds and Gainsborough to be the most important and fashionable portrait painter. 
the Earl was in fact Rumney's first aristocratic patron and was offered rooms in the towers of Warwick Castle to use as studios, which is quite amazing. Can you imagine it? Thanks. That artists were brought to this place almost to use as studios, but also as a place for inspiration, undoubtedly, that these young artists would be able to study the treasures of Warwick Castle and go on to produce fantastic works of art. Unfortunately, though, George Rumney never took up this offer, but it seems that other artists did. We know that George had brought the great John Smith, known as later as John Warwick Smith, after the Earl's patronage, to the town and encouraged him to, to become one of the most leading and influential watercolorists of this period. There are other artists that he's associated with, including, including George Augustus Wallace, another painter who would later be known as the English Poussin, famous for his landscape paintings in particular. And another interesting artist which I've written about recently is John Westbrook Chandler, who is in fact one of the Earl of Warwick's illegitimate sons, or maybe his father's illegitimate sons. Chandler exhibited several paintings at the Royal Academy and actually several times put down his address as Warwick Castle. So it's obvious that the Earl was keeping him here to, to use as a, as a refuge for inspiration. Yeah, gosh, just imagine. It's just amazing to think, you know, this this bastard boy was so well supported by, <laughs> you know, his his uh, half brother, you know, an aristocratic earl. Yes, incredibly curious indeed. So we've talked a bit about his love of portraits, but his love of the beauty of landscapes never really left him, did it? No, it didn't. He actually travelled around Europe with John Warwick Smith on a watercolouring tour. And Warwick Smith went on to produce some of the most exquisite landscape paintings of Italy and other places on the Grand Tour, specifically for the Earl. Indeed, the best of these watercolours are now in the British Museum, so important are they, as you can imagine. And also there's evidence that George continued throughout his life to produce watercolours. Some of them I found still in the record office today, and they, they really are quite impressive. They show that I think George really did want to capture the beauty of landscape and was very inspired by the picturesque movement developed by the likes of Gilpin and such others. It's obvious that this Earl didn't just want to collect works of art, but wanted to produce them himself, which which really mm. is such a Georgian thing, I have to say. Yes. Uh, and I've read about uh, another exciting document you've discovered in the Warwick Castle archive. Yes, a few years ago, I, I came across by chance an absolutely enormous manuscript of George Earl of Warwick's poetry. There are actually no fewer than 189 poems and lines and verses that he wrote. <laughs> These have never been discovered before. We always knew that George was a poet. One of his later friends, Olivia Wilmot Ceres, or Sears, actually wrote that the Earl was a passionate sonneteer. But only recently I've identified this enormous great big book as being his poetry manuscript. Mm. In his poems, you really, again, get that sense of the love of landscape. He's constantly writing about nature, the various effects that it brings on the soul and on emotions. He writes about the ability of artists to capture the beauty and emotions of scenes. I'd just love to read out a little line for you, which really does, I think, summarise it best. This is a, a little short snippet from one of his poems called Prosperity and Adversity, which describes this eternal striving of the artist to capture the scene that's in front of him. This is what he writes. But can your artist drive the waves along? By his command, attend them like a song. Bid the sun arise impetuous over the rocks, or hushed in echoing caverns safely lock. Can he more than give a feeble view of that which ever varying still is true, can he give fragrance to the blushing rose, or paint those matchless charms which nature throws over her work so beautifully spread, by which the artist is so much misled? So you can really, I think, get an idea that he's a proto-romantic in a way. He is fascinated by, by really pushing the limits to what poetry and art can do, particularly in the realms of nature, landscape, and its importance to the human soul, I think. And, of course, what's what's really interesting about this is at the same time we know that George is re-landscaping a lot of the grounds around 
Warwick Castle. I, I mean, I mean, do you think some of his poetry might have inspired or influenced some of his his landscaping work? Yes, I definitely think his poetry might have inspired him, but also his his work as a watercolour painter. You know, if you are an artist, let's say, which George was, an amateur at least, then you might imagine that this would have a profound effect on how you would go about redesigning Warwick Castle's Parkland. George's father's Francis, in fact, had, had employed Capability Brown to come and redesign the Parkland at Warwick Castle. And already by the late 18th century, it's clear that Brown's work was actually going out of fashion. There's this wonderful quote from the great Gilpin, who actually met George and described that the Earl had it in his mind to out-brown anything that had been done at Warwick Castle. So <laughs> you can really imagine that he wanted himself, I think, and he didn't employ, it seems, any great big landscape gardener to do it. But he himself wanted to to really improve the parkland at Warwick Castle, more on the lines of, of what a, a picturesque romantic park would have looked like. Mm -hmm. So he made a, a lake. He also increased the number of trees that were growing in the parkland. He established plantations, which also would give him an income, he hoped, although it doesn't seem like it went so well. <laughs> he also moved the main road into Warwick to make way for more space. He even demolished Warwick's medieval bridge coming in from the Banbury Road and allowed it to fall into ruin to, to again, to enhance the, that feeling of the historic romanticism of the place. And I think he did an absolutely phenomenal job in doing it. All of these things must have been influenced, I think, by his work in watercolours and also in poetry too. Of course, we come back to that all-important summary that uh, the historian Matthew Kilburn made at the beginning, which was that all this kind of extravagance and beauty left George and his family with enormous debts, you know, crippling debts. And I guess the ultimate question is, you know, do you think it was really worth it? By the year 1800, George had been publicly humiliated, really, by the debts that he had taken on. Indeed, some estimates put it that he owed probably nearly or close to £100,000 to his debtors, which is millions in our sums today. He wasn't unique in this regard. Aristocrats used to find themselves in debt absolutely all the time and still find themselves in such scenarios today. But I would argue that I do think it was worth it. By his death in 1816, George had really made Warwick Castle into one of the most beautiful and romantic places throughout the whole country, I would argue. Civilizations are really remembered for their buildings, and Warwick Castle will be remembered as, I think, one of the greatest. And although it is a medieval building, it was these Georgian owners who I think really took it up a notch. They filled it full of beautiful things, full of first-rate pieces of furniture, paintings, and also gave it a setting worthy of its beauty. And I think George Greville really was a, an artistic spirit. All that he did was to enhance the beauty of his magnificent home, and that, to some extent, we get to still enjoy today. So what do you think is George's legacy today? And of course, how much of his improvements have survived? Unfortunately, it's the sad fate of the 20th century that, that really begun the downfall of George's aesthetic vision. In the early 20th century, the Greville family were unable really to sustain the, the debts and wealth that they had accumulated over the century. And all of a sudden, works of art started to be sold from the collection. This really sped up in the 1960s and 70s when David, Lord Brook, and later 8th Earl of Warwick, started to look to his walls to keep his bank balance in the black. Also, incoming problems to do with inheritance tax really crippled the family, so much so that even masterpieces like the Warwick Vars needed to be sold off to sustain them, which was a, an absolutely incredible tragedy. And unfortunately, this still continues to this very day. Only five years ago or so, several very beautiful portraits, including by Van Dyck and Holbein's workshop, were sold off by the current owners of Warwick Castle, which has further, I think, watered down George's fantastic achievements and make Warwick Castle beautiful on the inside. And really what I should say is that no Earl of Warwick or any owner of Warwick Castle wanted you to see it empty, as indeed, sadly, it is becoming today. They wanted you to really get that sense of being surrounded by inspiring objects and things which, of course, 
make lots of money in auction houses today, which is a great shame. One thing I think that does survive rather well is the Parkland of Warwick Castle, which George recreated. But also, unfortunately, this too is largely inaccessible. A great majority of the family's land was sold off between the 1950s and 70s. So it's not even really possible for normal visitors to go off and explore the beautiful Warwick Castle Park, which gives views of the castle and its plantations and trees in a way that is so impressive still to this very day. The grounds of Warwick Castle too are still very beautiful, notoriously the pageant field, the so-called pageant field, which was established by George at the end of the 18th century, really, I think, to give a Claudian perspective looking down the hill towards the River Avon below. It's so picturesque that it could have, I believe, only have been made by somebody guided by a ferocious artistic spirit like George. It feels like a painting by Claude, I often think, when I'm standing at the top, looking down on a clear summer's day from the conservatory, which George also had built. Yes, yeah, it's so amazing, actually, isn't it, that on, on a visit to Warwick Castle today, there's there's still so much of the kind of vision that George had. And I guess going back to, to what uh, Matthew Kilburn said is, you know, of course, you know, all of this work did lead to financial ruin and, and hardship for his family in the, the decades that followed. But I think from what I can tell from what you said is I, I don't think we can really call this misguided, can we? I mean, there was clearly an ambition and, and, and a drive here that was that was guiding George and, and what he hoped to achieve, not necessarily for himself, but, but for the future. Very much so. During the last decade of his life, George actually didn't see Warwick Castle so much. This was mostly because he fell out with his wife and also son and heir. They were uh, rather estranged to him. But on one of his final visits to Warwick Castle, he describes how remarkably quickly the trees are growing, which I think is a, a very poetic thing to say. The idea that when he was first planting these trees, they were mere, almost mere saplings. But mm. by towards the end of his life, already he could see the wonderful cedars and oaks and other magnificent plantations that were starting to take shape and that we get to enjoy to this very day. I think the future was very much a part of what he had in mind. And I would argue through aesthetic reasoning that all of this money, this great fortune was very well spent.